I was on Paul, two difficult Bible readings in one morning. <laughs> Ruby's got some uh, sermon hand handouts, um, although it's on the screen, obviously. Um, between a bit of a rock and a hard place this morning, we were out at Makiro's last night and something came up and Tori goes, but sometimes you're so loud I have to cover my ears. Got up this morning and Nadia said, Ross, you've got to jump about and preach loud this morning to keep me awake. <laughs> and I really didn't say anything, but I know what she was thinking. Nadia, don't encourage him. So <laughs> uh, uh, if I'm loud uh, this morning, Tori, you can blame Nadia. All right, because she we kept her up too late. Talking last night was the problem. and uh, She was late to bed, well past her beauty sleep time. Not that Nadia needs a lot of beauty sleep. <laughs> we can't go there. <laughs> Let's uh, bow in prayer. Almighty God, once again we come to sit under the authority of your word. Pray you would teach those who need teaching, encourage those who need encouraging, rebuke and correct those who need rebuking and correcting, that we might do all for your glory through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now, last week I asked you to do some homework to read Genesis 44, Judah's speech, the longest speech in uh, Genesis, and to count up the number of times the word father appeared there. Well, I thought I'd give you some help in case you did it and have forgotten. Um, so I said you'd need more than your two hands, so it's not 10. You can rule out A there. Anybody want to take a guess? Did anybody do the homework or they just want to take a guess? 12, 14 or 16 times. Someone speak up. 14. 14, that's right. And uh, that's important, as I said, because remember, children particularly, uh, you didn't have this story to read like we have it today. If you'd lived back in Moses' time or David's time, that list of names that... Uh, Paul just read in the genealogy from Matthew. Most of these stories you had to hear and remember. Now, remember, people could read and write. It wasn't that they were dumb and couldn't read and write. It was just there wasn't the availability of the printing press and, and our day, the computer and all that. So books were rare, um, expensive, and so you learnt things by remembering them. And I'm going to come back into this uh, in a, a little bit, God willing. And, and so uh, the stories were told and key words were important. And when you read that speech of Judas, 14 times, it's the father, our, our, our father, it's about Jacob, Jacob, the father, the father. You come to this passage, it's an interesting passage, isn't it? It's not the usual passage you'd preach on. It's not the usual passage you're going to have at family devotions and worship and talk about with your children. It's one of the very sad passages in Scripture, uh, full of sin. No, m m the mention of God is very heavy. Twice the Lord's mentioned, and it's when he kills two of Judah's, uh, Judah's sons. It's a difficult passage. And some of the commentators, they, they just about jump over this passage. The liberal scholars, of course, say that, that this passage is all in the wrong place, that, that you can't have chapter 37 and then this chapter and then chapter 39. But holding a higher view of Scripture than that, we believe the Holy Spirit's put this passage where it is in the Scriptures because it's part of the story. And remember, the story is the story not of Joseph but of Judah. And the focus on this chapter of Judah uh, is on Judah, and it's a focus there to remind you that Judah is completely and utterly undeserving of the role he ends up having in the line of the Messiah. And it is about, therefore, God's grace, how God can take a man of Judah, Judah one of the covenant children who sinks into such depths of sin and his family sinks into such depths of sin that their two of his sons are so wicked, the Lord literally destroys them. And yet God takes this man and makes him the great, great grandfather of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about God's covenant faithfulness and the triumph of, 
of grace over sin. This is a passage that's full of sin, isn't it? It's a passage that's dismal, that's sad, that's heavy. It's about broken relationships, broken promises, hurtful people. You, you particularly get the feeling in the passage that Tamar is hurting here, the, the woman at the centre of the passage. What hope is there when you read this passage? Well, it's the hope that God can take anybody's life, no matter how broken it is in sin, no matter what depths of sin they've uh, fallen into, and by grace transform them. And as you read on in the story of Judah and you get to that great speech of Judah's in Genesis 44, you've got to see the change in Judah from chapter 38 to chapter 44. And that change is the change of the covenant God is full of grace and mercy who forgives sin and who restores people and is building his church and is fulfilling his covenant promises. At that time... At that time, what time? Well, the time that Joseph has gone down into Egypt. Now, Judah's played a leading role in that, hasn't he? Because he's the one that said, let's sell him. Don't let's kill him. Let's sell him to these relatives of ours, the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, and get rid of him. And then Judah's gone home and had to deceive his father about what's happened to Joseph. At that time, one wonders whether Judah is so confronted with his father's grief at this moment that he has to flee. The passage doesn't tell you that, does it? But remember how jo jo uh, Jacob just won't be consoled about the death of his son. Judah knows he's played a leading part in this. And so what does he do? He departs the covenant family and goes off and uh, lives with the pagans. He left his brothers. Now, again, you see the little, the little links in this story? What's happened to Joseph? Well, he's left his brothers too, but he's been forced away from his brothers, hasn't he? And his brothers are now in Israel, and he's down in Egypt. Ju Judah. Joseph didn't leave his brothers willingly, but Judah leaves his brothers willingly. So there's all these little interconnections and plays in the story that you've got to get. Remember again, you're listening to the story, you're not reading it. You've got to pick up on these keys. Notice how quickly time goes. And this is a biblical pattern in the Old Testament in particular for stories. What happens in the biblical narrative, if you think of it like a movie, that, that there's great chunks of time that happen so quickly. In fact, they're just skipped over. And then suddenly the movie stops and the, the camera as it is zooms in and you have this narrative, this particular story. Because Judah leaves, and next thing he's married and he's got grown sons. Now, even if the sons were married when they were young, at you know, 18 or 20 years of old age, what happens in these first six or seven verses is you have this sudden rush of time, 20 years roughly, covered like that, while Joseph's down in Egypt. And then the story suddenly stops, doesn't it? And it zooms into this one narrative that covers three months from Judah's uh, sleeping with his daughter-in-law, who he thinks is a prostitute, and finding out she's pregnant three months later. So you, you've got to see what's happening here. And this whole 20 years, of course, you've got to remember where Joseph is. And we're going to, the scriptures pick up that in the next chapter. Now go back to this idea again of, words and themes in the story. Notice in this whole story in Jacob's life, going right back to Jacob, how goats keep coming up. And this is part of the way you remember the story, children. Okay, so let's go way back earlier into Genesis. How did Jacob steal the birthright from his son, his brother, rather, Esau? Well, remember... The old fellow's dying, old Isaac, and he's just about blind. And he says to Esau, go and cook me one of your favourite meals. Go out and get a deer or something, get some game, because Esau was a hunter. And uh, Jacob's mum, Rebecca, hears, and she says, I don't want Esau to get the 
the birthright I want Jacob so she says and they go through that plot you know and she gets a goat till they kill a goat and they cook a goat up and they put the skin on Jacob and they put Esau's clothes on him and when he goes into Isaac Isaac can't see and he says that the voice sounds like Jacob but it smells like Esau and he gives the birthright to Jacob the goats there used as part of the deception here we have a goat in the previous chapter. What is it that's killed and the robe of Joseph is dipped in? Goat's blood. And here we have another goat in the story. Well, let's send the what will, what will you give me, Tamar says. I'll give you a goat. And so then he sends the goat down and they can't find it. And you get that irony in the story where Judah says, well, we might be a laughing stock. You know, and, and uh, he's worried about his own ego and his pride. Uh, and not the sin that he's fallen into. But there's all these links in the story that you've got to follow, not just in the Joseph story, but right through the story of Genesis. And that comes up again here in this story of uh, chapter 38, again, where the deceiver is deceived. This, of course, goes back into Genesis. Who deceived his father to get the birthright? Jacob. Jacob, who's deceived when he gets married? Well, Jacob is, doesn't he? Because he wants to marry Rachel and Laban tricks him into marrying Leah. And then he's deceived about the death of his son. And here we have Judah, who, like his father, is a deceiver because he's involved at a critical point in the previous chapter to deceive his father about the death of his brother, about Joseph, the death of Jacob's precious son. And now the deceiver is being deceived. And so you, I bring all this up because it's how you need to understand this in the flow of the story. And not just in Genesis, but in other biblical stories. You see it, particularly in the story of David and Goliath, where the whole issue is about the heart of the people involved, particularly Saul's heart, King Saul and King David's hearts. The common themes, if you miss those, you won't understand what the passage is saying. You won't be able to interpret the passage saying, and also understand how it points to Christ. Because at the heart of this, the story is about Christ. It's not just a moral story of, it's not a biblical Shakespeare or a biblical Aesop's fable with a nice little moral tact on the end of it. It's about the Messiah, the coming one. So following that whole story is important. What you see in this chapter is that in the life of Judah, the covenant flame has just about flickered out, doesn't it? Look at Judah in this passage. Where is he? He's living away from his brothers. Yes, he's still in the promised land, but he's living with the pagans. His closest friend is a pagan who has no covenant promises or no, at this point, inheritance in the covenant or any point in the story. He's married to a covenant uh, woman. A non-covenant woman, I should say. He's not even told her name. Do you notice that in the story? It just tells us he got married. And who did she, he marry? He married a Canaanite, a daughter from a Canaanite man, Shua. And you should remember earlier in the story, way back in Genesis 15, God has said that he's going to judge the Canaanites to Abraham because of their sin and their wickedness. And so what's being told you here is that Judah has basically rejected the blessings and covenant promises that God's given to him through his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather. And in, to put it in modern language, he's left the church and he's gone off and living with the pagans and he's acting like a pagan. And there's no difference between him who should be a shining light of the covenant God and the pagans living around him. He's pagan in his behaviour, he's pagan in his thinking, and he's ultimately come to that point where it seems he's just about totally rejected the covenant promises that God had given. Remember, at the heart of that covenant promise, in terms of the human side, is that 
command by God in Genesis 17, when God gives the covenant of circumcision to Abraham, what? Walk before me and be blameless. That's how Judah's supposed to be living. Judah's supposed to be living as a child of the promise, as a child of the covenant, in holiness and in godliness and in blamelessness. And then you look at what the Holy Spirit says about him in this passage of Scripture, and it's the exact opposite, isn't it? It's sin. It's deception. It's lies. It's wickedness. It's evil. And sadly, any one of us can fall into that same position. You children, particularly, got to understand that as you grow up in the church with all the access to all the promises of God, doesn't mean that you're not in danger as you move out of childhood and teenage years and into adulthood of doing exactly what Judah does here. Not maybe the same sins, but the same mentality, the same mindset of rejecting the gospel and saying, no, I'm not going to go to church with mum and dad anymore. I'm going to go off and live with my pagan friends and do the things that they're doing. That's where the excitement is. That's where the adrenaline rush is. That's where the buzz is. That's what I want to be involved with. Many a young life starts out well, it seems, in covenant homes and ends up being ruined in paganism and in sin and debauchery. So Judah goes, and first of all, he goes to live with the pagans, and then he lives as a pagan. Now, time is against us here, isn't it? There's many things, many issues here you could, you could raise, for instance. We have to live in the world. The Apostle Paul addresses this in Corinthians. He says, he says, when I tell you not to be worldly, he says, I'm not saying don't live in the world, otherwise we'd have to escape the world. We've got to mix with pagans at work. We live next door to them. We want to share the gospel with them. So there's an abundance of questions to be raised here. Okay? And I'm not going to address those all. So, so don't think in what I'm saying here this morning that I'm falling into the, the monastery mentality that developed in the early church after Constantine. Oh, the world's bad. And if I want to be a good Christian, I've got to go and live over here where there's no world. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about rejecting the promises of God and going and living as one who has nothing to do with the people of God. Because that's where Judah is. He's cut off from his family. He's living with the pagans. And more significantly, he's living as a pagan. Judah's children reflect their dad, don't they? Effectively, at this point, Judah, for all intents and purposes, is a covenant breaker. And his children act that way. This 20 years goes past. Don't quite know how old uh, Ur was when he got married, but, um, you know, it's interesting. Probably younger, although we were talking last night, and Isaac was 40 before he got married to Rebecca, Abraham's son, but... Doesn't seem that that's the case here. Ur's wicked. We're not told what his wickedness was. Was it because of the sexual themes in the passage, some sort of sexual sin, or was it just something else? But whatever it was, it was bad, because this is a serious verse in the Scripture, isn't it? But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Now that doesn't appear in the scriptures a lot. It appears other places. But that phrase wicked should trigger something in your mind about the Genesis story. What other part of the Genesis story was uh, wicked so bad, the world so wicked, what did God do? He flooded it. See what's being said about Ur here? He's as bad as the people at Noah's day, and God destroyed the whole world. So whatever his sin was, whatever his wickedness was, this is a young man, only five generations from Abraham, who's become so wicked and so pagan, even within the confines of the promise of the covenant, that God destroys him. That's a, a heavy verse in the Scriptures. And again, to, to all of us, 
young and old, but particularly you young people. You don't treat the promises of God with contempt. You don't take them for granted. And you reject them at your own peril. God is involved here. And for those of us who are parents and grandparents, as, as much as you might bring up your children in the nurture and discipline of the Lord, grace doesn't flow in the blood. Not all covenant children go on to walk in the faith of their parents. You do everything you can, but if your children reject the gospel, then they put themselves under serious danger. Now, of course, the same said about Onan just a few sentences later, didn't it? Verse 10, what he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. This is deep serious sin in the midst of those who should be the people of God. This is the grandson of Jacob, the great-grandson of Abraham, and he's so wicked. Now, it, it, I don't want to go into all the details. There's no need to do that. But it is interesting. Judah shares some of the blame here. Notice how careful the text is. Ur dies... And Judah says to Onan, lie with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to produce offspring for her brother. Now that is, of course, later on enshrined in the law after Moses. But notice what's not said. Did you notice what's not said? He doesn't say marry her. He doesn't say take your brother's widow and marry her. He just says go in and sleep with her. That is, poor Tamar is treated just like a sex object to produce a grandson for Judah's own self-gratification. There's deep and difficult things here. The, the, the passage needs looking at from Tamar's side and how she's so wrongly treated by Judah in particular in this passage. But is it a surprise that two of Judah's sons are so wicked when their father is setting them such a bad example. Judah's children then are covenant breakers and God judges them accordingly. But there is, at the end of the story, despite all the sin, a glimpse of hope for Judah. And by God's grace, that hope's going to grow and and eventually you get the Judah later in the story who is such a different Judah and, uh, and seems to be restored to the covenant promises. Go with me to verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution and as a result she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. Now, nothing about the fact that he's committed adultery by sleeping with a prostitute, just it's all her fault. And so he, she says, well, who owns these? And then in verse 30, 26, Judah recognised them and said, she is more righteous than I. There's a glimpse of hope there, you see. Judah starts to realise that he's acted wrongly. And that Tamar, who is so badly treated and so wrongly abused in this story, and is, remember, the daughter of a, a, a Canaanite, acts more godly than the child of the promise. You know, that can happen even today. Pagan people can act better sometimes than some of us in the church. Sometimes you find it's better to deal with a non-Christian in business than someone who professes to be a Christian because the non-Christian person, for all their faults and their misunderstanding of the gospel, might at least be a person who keeps their word and doesn't try and shaft you in some way. Now, I think, personally think Tamar will be in heaven. She's a... She's in the line, we'll come back to this a little later, she's in the line of the Messiah. Um, but at this point in time, Judah is making a significant observation. That is, he starts to suggest for a moment that 
he is guilty of sin and that he is accountable and that God has not totally abandoned him. I think there's a, there's a hint here of God's grace in this story. You know, as you, you read the story, it, it raises so many questions, doesn't it? Why does a middle-aged man, seemingly out of the blue, suddenly go and sleep with a prostitute? Well, there's the answer's in the story, if you read it carefully. I'm not going to tell you the answer. You can read the story and work the answer out for yourself. If you haven't worked it out next week, I'll tell it to you. Two mentions of God in this passage. We haven't heard about God in Genesis 36, where we have the tolly dot of Esau. We haven't heard about God in the last chapter, where we have the story of Joseph. We've heard twice about the Lord here in this chapter. God keeps his covenant going. Now notice what's said about God here. Those two verses which are so heavy and so judgmental in verse 7, the Lord put him to death. And in verse 10, he did what was wicked in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death. The Holy Spirit has carefully chosen the word Lord there. You would actually expect at that point God, the Hebrew word Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Bereshit and Barah Elohim. In the beginning, God created. But what's put there is not Elohim, but the Tetragrammaton, the Lord, the special word, you know, that, that even today the Jews won't pronounce. So if, if Paul is in the synagogue when he was reading this this morning, he would have seen in the Hebrew text a little asterisk there, and he would have looked over into the margin, and in the margin is a replacement word, the other Hebrew word for Lord, and he would read that because the Jews still won't try and pronounce the Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton, the Yahweh, is so important because it's the covenant word for God in the Old Testament. And so right at this moment, it's not just that God, the God of the world, who, who, who deals in one sense with everybody, but this is the Lord, the covenant God. It's, it's locating all of this again for you in the covenant, you see. It's the covenant God dealing with the covenant people, in this case, covenant breakers. There's covenant judgment in the death of Ur and Odin. It's a reminder God is at work. Here's Judah. He's left Jacob for whatever reason, perhaps a guilty conscience. Scriptures don't say that. Be careful of arguments from silence. He's gone off. He's made friends with a pagan. He's married a pagan girl. He's living in a pagan. His actions are like pagans. Where's God? Well, God hasn't abandoned him. In fact, God hasn't abandoned him to the point that God deals severely with his family for the sake of Judah, which is ultimately for the sake of Joseph, which is to keep the people alive for the sake of Judah, for the sake of Christ. There's covenant mercy here. God is keeping Judah to protect Joseph. Sorry, the other way around. God is keeping Judah and Joseph will provide for Judah so that Judah can be in the line for Christ. Now, the amazing thing is at the end of the story, isn't it? These two children, two boys. She was giving birth. And one kid stuck his hand out. So the midwife wrote some scarlet thread around him. The Hand goes back into the womb, the other baby comes out first, and so they're given various names. The wonderful thing here is, despite all of Judah's sin, what's happening here? The Messiah is coming. And that's why I got Paul to read that other passage, because when you go to Matthew chapter 1, that story's right there in Matthew chapter 1, isn't it? Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Here is Tamar, who was so poorly treated in that story. She's one of the five women mentioned in the genealogy. Well, Mary's the last one, and she's the mother of Jesus. 
four women are mentioned in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tamar is the first one. And it's interesting, of the four women that are mentioned, and one of them is not even mentioned by name, three of them are mentioned in the Bible in bad sexual situations. Tamar here, Rahab, what was she? A prostitute. Uriah, the wife. Uh, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, Bathsheba, she was a daughterer. The only one who comes out clean is Ruth, who also was, of course, a Moabite. But you see here God's great covenant mercy and all of this filth and muck and sin and brokenness of Genesis 38. God is working to bring Christ into the world. God is keeping his promise to Abraham that there would come from Abraham a seed. And that seed, as Paul writes in Galatians, is Christ. And he is the one who is coming. And he's coming to deal with just the filth and the muck that Judah's made up of his life. Because Christ, the great, 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 great grandson of Judah, is going to hang on that cross and shed his blood for Judah's sin. As he hangs on the cross and sheds his blood for your sin. You know and trust him. Oh, there's depths and depths and depths of mercy in this passage. Here's the mercy of God breaking over this passage and beauty and glory and all this filth and this muck that is a sinful world. The glory of God's love and grace and mercy shines through because God keeps the flame burning even when you and I are trying to put it out. We sang it before. No man can pluck him out of my hand and me out of his hand. I was reading that passage in John 10 this week when Jesus is talking about the sheep and the and uh, uh, the shepherd and the good being the good shepherd. And twice he says in that passage, he says, firstly, no man can pluck you out of my hand, and then no man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. And what he's reminding you is if you're a believer, and remember we don't just we're not just paradox, paradox, talking about being once being saved, always saved here. But if you're a believer, no matter how much sin you might sink yourself into, God's mercy and grace is going to triumph in your life. You might fall into the same sort of debauchery as Judah does. But the God of grace and mercy will wrap you up in his love and pick you up out of your filth and put you on your feet. The psalmist says it, doesn't he? Though I fall, though I fall, yet I will not be cast out. You can trip over in the mud. You can lie, you can cheat, you can rob, you can steal, you can be full of pride and you can be full of arrogance. And all those things are wrong. And God's never going to approve of them. But he's not going to abandon you if you're his child. Because he keeps his covenant. Others around you might fall. But he will keep his covenant. And the wonderful point when you read Matthew chapter 1 and that long list of names that Paul read so well before and you see Tamar and you see Rahab and you see Bathsheba and you see Judah and you see David and you realise that God is winning the battle. God is victorious. And how does it end at that? Passage in verse 17 there, the Messiah has come. He's, he's come, he's arrived. Through all this sin and through all this failure and through all this long story and through all the tragedies and through all the mess and through all the failure, the, the going into captivity because of the wicked people's wickedness and sin and the destruction of the temple and everything else, what comes through? God wins. God is victorious. Christ reigns. And the blood of the Lamb is able to deal with all that filth before the cross and all the filth after the cross. Because in heaven, there's only righteousness and holiness and beauty and truth. It's a triumph of grace over sin. It's what the Holy Spirit writes for the Apostle, isn't it, in Romans 5. Where sin did abound, grace Super about it. Oh, Genesis 38 is full of sin. Wickedness, evil. Tamar is absolutely treated like dirt. God triumphs. 
You look at Genesis 38 and it seems as though Satan's winning, doesn't he? Covenant promises are broken. People are hurt. People are abused. People are judged. People die. Young, young men die because of their sin. Satan seems to win. God has a greater purpose. And that is that out of this sin should come the Messiah. And that very Messiah who is from this line of sin is the one who triumphs over sin. His blood is shed to deal with that sin. Not just Judah's sin. Not just Tamar's sin. But she does sin by playing the role of a prostitute. But your sin. To cleanse. To forgive. To restore. To take home from heaven. Let us bow in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that in the midst of this sad, sorry, sinful saga that is Genesis 38, you are working. You are working for the coming of your Son. You worked for the coming of the Son, and as we look back from this side of the cross, we see the victory, the triumph that came out of chapters like this. We thank you for Christ, O oh Father. We thank you that he did what Judah failed to do, that he has done what we have failed to do, and that, Lord Jesus, your blood alone cleanses us from sin, takes us to heaven. And, Lord, while we'll be interested to see Judah there and Tamar there and many others there, in the end our focus will be taken up with the Lamb the one who is the Lord of glory. And we bow in your presence, worship you. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Russ.